I'm Justin Mitchell, and you are listening to the American edition of The Voice of Russia. For the last few weeks, we've been doing a series called The Endless Fringe about uh, extremism in the United States, which takes many different forms. A lot of uh, the groups that we've looked into have been involved with the white supremacy movement in America. One of these stranger through lines that overlaps with a lot of these groups is the ideology of Christian identity, which is a bizarre racist offshoot of the Christian religion. To find out a little bit more about this, I'm joined today by Leonard Zeskind. He is the author of Blood and Politics, the History of the White Nationalist Movement from the Margins to the Mainstream. Uh, Mr. Zeskind, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be with you. Um, Can you go ahead and explain for people who've never heard of it what Christian identity is and how it differs from uh, regular Christianity? Well, it's a theology Uh, There are points of overlap with regular Christianity, but it's a a, a theology that holds that white people from northern Europe are actually the lost tribes of Israel, and that uh, because of that, America is the biblical promised land, and uh, the white Christians from northern Europe are the biblical... Uh, Israelite, descended from the biblical Israelites. People of color are uh, pre-Adamic, that is, that they're descended from beasts of the field that were created before Adam, and they're soulless. Jews are devil, either devils incarnate or devil-like. So that's the core of the theology. Where did this, where and when did this uh, Christian identity theology get started? Is it an American creation or not? Well, uh, Christian, Christian identity is an outgrowth of a, of a uh, 19th century, 1800s uh, theology called British Israelism. And British Israelism was invented to explain the triumph of the British colonial period and so forth. And it holds ideas similar to the Israelites, to Christian identity. The Christian identity developed after World War II in the United States. It's more of a United States phenomenon. And it explains not supremacy so much as dispossession, uh, a promised land that you've lost. So it's it's born in the period when civil rights are developing, when decolonialization is happening in Europe, and so on. Okay, interesting. So it's kind of a response based on white America or some white Americans to sort of losing their traditional dominance in American yeah, social and economic... Theological, it's a theological understanding that takes into account the changes that were going on with white America. So what made you get interested in uh, the Christian identity movement originally? Well, it was in the mid-1980s when the far right was trying to recruit uh, farmers and people from the rural Midwest where I live. And there was an economic crisis in agriculture at the time. Farm prices were declining, and there was a lot of turmoil in uh, the rural America, and uh, they were trying to recruit, and they did recruit, and there was this one camp in Rulo, Nebraska, where uh, a couple of uh, kids got, uh, a 25-year-old man and a couple of kids got murdered, and I was doing trainings trying to help the farmers figure themselves out and not get caught up in all that. I think it was 1986, and I met the parents of the 25-year-old, and they said, my son was a follower of Christian identity, and he got involved in this group that killed him, and he went to his pastor, and his pastor could not help him. I became very interested in that fact that the churches were unprepared to deal with this. And the first thing I did was uh, go to the National Council of Churches and write a monograph that was well distributed to uh, pastors 
on the Christian identity phenomenon. You, you explain in your book pretty clearly that there are two major uh, types of Christian identity uh, theologies, and it's kind of important to know this because the people that believe these two different theologies tend to act in different ways. Could you explain the difference? Uh, one is called the one-seaters and one is called the two-seaters. Could you explain yeah, what those are? This is a piece of arcana that seems so small and particular that why pay any attention to it, but it has big implications in understanding everything. And uh, in this schema, there's the two-seaters are the ones who believe that Eve's child, Cain, is actually uh, the child of the devil, that she was impregnated by the snake in the garden, and uh, that she had the seed of the devil in her and that the the Cain is the father of the Jews in this schema. And and the the one-seaters don't believe that for a minute. They hold that Jews are actually descended from Edomites, the children of Esau. And you might remember, there's, uh, there's, again, there's brothers, there's uh, Cain and Abel, and then there's uh, Jacob and Esau. And uh, Jacob being the father of the Israelites, and then Esau being the father of a group of people who went out and mingled with other races and so forth. And the and that's the Jews, and they're they're a satanic force, but they are not the devil incarnate. So it's sort of a differing of belief in the level to which Jews are equivalent to the, Satan. Yeah, originally the two seaters had dominance in the U.S., but In the 1980s and 90s, the the one-seaters came and had probably the biggest, they were the more mainstream of the two, and less violent and more likely to succeed at growing congregations and so forth. While the uh, the two seaters tended to be more militant, sort of vanguardist? The the two seaters tended to want to take up arms right away. Can you give me some examples of uh, some two-seaters people may have heard of? I've uh... Well, Aryan Nations was a two-seater, and Richard Butler was a two-seat preacher. Uh, the Covenant Sword and Arm of the Lord, to the extent that they had a theology, it was Christian identity, and, and uh, they were two-seaters. And they were also involved in some of the, you know, blow it up and shoot it down episodes of the... Uh, Mid 1980s. Those are the two most prominent. Um, you mentioned some of the um, militant actions of the mid 80s. I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I think a lot of people, especially younger people, don't remember that this happened. Uh, we all have heard probably about you know the Weathermen and you know far left groups in the 60s and the 70s, but in the uh, the 80s and to a point the 90s, there were some. Uh, there was a pretty robust racist right underground. Could you go ahead and talk about uh, what happened in the mid 80s? Well, unlike the Weathermen, whose violence was largely symbolic and aimed at buildings, uh, except for the sad case where they blew themselves up, the the racist violence was directed at people. So. Uh, there was an underground army called the Order starting in 83, and they lasted through 85. They robbed banks. Uh, they killed uh, a radio talk show personality, Allen Berg, in Denver. Uh, they also uh, tried to blow up a pipeline and did some other nefarious deeds and counterfeiting and so forth. Uh, and that was the main uh, group in the mid-80s, it was called the Order. Or the Silent Brotherhood as well, right? Yeah, there were various names for it. All right, and it seems like, this is from my understanding as a layman, is Christian identity sort of hit its peak in the 80s and 90s and then maybe declined after that? What's your response to that? Do you think that's right? or? Well, uh, what's happened is uh, once the white power skinheads came into the scene, there was a drive to recruit, and, and they really appeared in the late 80s as a white supremacist phenomenon and then into the 90s. Uh, there were a lot of number of instances where the Christian, ident- where Christian identity purposely 
set out to recruit white power skinheads. But a lot of times that did not take. Christian identity didn't fit with the white power skinheads, and they tended to either be secular or followers of Odin and Thor and the Norse religions. And as those years have progressed and the generations of white supremacists who were active prior to the emergence of the white power skinheads began to fade, white, a Christian identity has, has not disappeared, but it has tended to fade. And scientific racism and Nordic religions now have as much, if not more, of a hold over the white nationalist scene today. Fair enough. The Christian identity movement is still out there, I believe. I mean, last summer, I believe, the summer of 2012, I believe, Paul Mullet, a pastor in Ohio, attempted to register as a lobbyist, or he did actually, and he is a Christian identity pastor. Can you tell me where... Where is the Christian identity movement these days, in your opinion? Well, it's in the same place as it always was. There's followers of Aryan nations. Uh, They're still about. They hang out with the National Socialist Movement these days. Uh, There's still Klansmen. Some of the Klansmen are a Christian identity, as in back as far as the 60s, the Klansmen were Christian identity. And uh, and there's some Christian patriot groups that are Christian identity. But there's now the growth of scientific racist think tanks, uh, little Europe settlements, and so forth. And um, these don't have that set of ideas. Leonard Zeskin is the author of Blood in Politics, the history of the white nationalist movement from the margins to the mainstream. We've been discussing the Christian identity movement. Uh, Mr. Zeskin, thanks so much for joining us today. All right. My pleasure to be uh, speaking with you. I'm Justin Mitchell, and you're listening to the American edition of The Voice of Russia.